Thanks. I'm, uh, my qualification for doing this is that I've uh, written a certain amount about Billy. I've been a fan of his for a long time. I've written a certain amount about him. And I have... Um, what, what I'm going to do, if it's okay, is read a list of things that Billy's done since he showed here um, <clears throat> at the beginning of last year. If I'll, I'll read the list. It's quite a long list, so settle, settle back your seats. Um, I hope it doesn't embarrass Billy. There's a couple down here in the front that are all <coughs> clear. You can sit together if you want. Steve's feeling a bit lonely. They're all met the left. Yeah. Cheers, mate. Pleasure. So I'm going to read this list, and it goes like this. Billy showed here in um, between the end of February and the middle of April last year. He, he showed more or less concurrently at White Columns Gallery in New York and uh, an important show also more or less concurrently at his principal gallery, L13 Gallery in London. And at the same time, uh, a book was launched, one of Billy's books called Bonds, Buggery and Buddhism, I think we've agreed to call that a novella that's under discussion with what category of literature you that is. Call I agree to call it. Which okay. isn't. We'll return to that. <laughs> um, after that, to the great surprise of the art world, he showed with the uh, important German gallery, Nugarine Schneider, in Basel. That was a very big... Well, the, the I say was a significant change in Billy's exhibition history. The Nugarim Schneider showed, um, I think it's true to say, surprised the art world because Billy, as I'm sure you know, has not um, been accorded the honour that is his due. Um, there was, after that, uh, oh, at the same time as the Basel show, a small show, a beautiful show of uh, painted works, aphorisms on <clears throat> painted on signboards, and that was at a, uh, a gallery called Maison uh, de la Posée. After that, there was a <coughs> book of Billy's poems, um, un The Uncorrected Poems, that was launched at L13, and that, uh, a show of Billy's drawings accompanied that, um, or the book accompanied the show of Billy's drawings, I'm not sure which. <laughs> then... There was a, a show in Cork Street presented by L13 and David Lilford Fine Art. And that was the Art Hate Show. Maybe you saw it. It wasn't on for very long. High, um, highly um, difficult show for some people. Um, that was a group show. And Jimmy Corti, Jamie, Billy, Billy was the um, supreme leader. It, uh, other contributors, contributors were Jimmy Corti, Jamie Reed, Harry Adams. Harry Adams is Steve, Steve Lowe and his working partner, Adam Wood, and Charlotte Young. And I contributed to that. There's a book out in the <coughs> foyer of that show. Then Billy curated, curated a show, Pete Bennett and Janine Guy. How do you pronounce Janine? Goidi. Goidi. That was at L13. There were various poster projects um, that Billy and Steve and the troops um, came up with. And you may have seen some of those in Stool Pigeon magazine. There was a, a, a significant project of advertisements in Art Review magazine. There was a, then a fine collection of Billy's early poetry published by Michael Curran, The Tangerine. Press. Um, there is a Billy's written a new novel, The Stonemason, which um, has just been launched at L13. And uh, a show of Billy's early drawings accompanied that show, <coughs> proving completely that Billy is a very fine drafts person. If anyone, wants to, if anyone had any doubt about that. Um, there's a big show of Billy's work coming up at Liman Mopan in New York, uh, one-person show. 
believe they're going to be in a summer show, a group show there as well. Um, in terms of music, there's Billy and the MBE, the members, musicians of the British Empire, which really Hamper and Wolf have, have a seven-inch single. Uh, the Vernon Poets have an album. This is all since, remember, it's since um, the ICA show here about a year ago. One Vernon Poets album, Poets of England. Vernon Poets are now called the Spartan Dregs. They put three, so far put out three of five seven-inch singles. Spartan Dregs album is due out in September. Um, and Billy's now started recording the Chatham Singers album. And uh, Billy has a new book of poems out. When is it out? I don't know, I think it's, um, uh, we've, Tangerine Press, uh, uh, I don't know if any of you know Tangerine Press, is a fellow called Michael Curran, we work with him sometimes, and he, he's a, um, a carpenter who in his spare time <coughs> makes um, really beautiful hand-bound editions yeah. of the collect collections, and he, he's got a new, uh, the last of the Tangerine uh, collections has come out, and he's... Um, got some of the poems in there. So the people who are publishing, the uh, Black Eve are publishing the, uh, the new collection, have agreed to wait till he gets his thing out before they do the book. So it's all dependent on Michael and how fast he binds his tangerine. Might do in addition to uh, even more. So. Yeah, might yeah. do, yeah. But I haven't seen what the poems are like. And that's going <laughs> to be called Paraffin Van. That's Paraffin Van. Michael yeah, Grandfather okay. used to run his own Paraffin, paraffin Surface. Surface, paraffin, paraffin service. When he wasn't in the dockyard, at the same time, he's a bit of a jack of all trades. So, and, and then last but not least, working in collaboration with his partner, Julie Hamper, Billy had a baby just before the ICA show last year, which. Um, That's good, isn't it? Do you hear that? <laughs> no involvement from L13 no, Gallery. No, no, no. Okay. So, that's a considerable list of. Uh, uh, Significant, that's a significant exhibition history by any standards, significant change in Billy's uh, uh, reception by the mighty art world, and um, a lot of creativity and... Um, Business as usual. Yes. So, in some senses, that's no, as Billy just said, that's, that nothing's changed, because Billy is uh, a, a, a profound energy. Um, what's different is... It's the, uh, the um, more worldly honour accorded him. Um, so, brings me to my first formal question, as written down here. This, um, the, the, the way you're being received now, being, is that, um, are you disappointed, Billy? Disappointed by what? By the, the, the honour accorded to you by the, by the art world. At the ICA show, there was an art hate poster uh, that under issued under Billy's um, auspices. auspices, and that was um, an exhortation for the public to um, uh, demonstrate it against art and to meet outside the ICA. So when that poster was put out, that was a very provocative to, to statement. And then at the time of the show, that was seen in the ICA, uh, displayed in the ICA, uh, bookshop um, display. That's that's quite normal stuff, though. You know, like we did we did one for against. Steve was mainly responsible for that ICA one, and it, we also did one for the um, Tates and Ives uh, against Wallace. Everyone had to go and hate Wallace. And at the time, I was writing this text for Wallace for the because just so happens I know that I did an exhibition with a fellow who works down at Tate, uh, St Ives, when he was um, doing his first shabby exhibition at a local art school and he was their exhibition organiser and he sort of like studied under Higgs to learn how to do this myth mythological thing that doesn't exist called curating <laughs> and he, um, so he's down there and we people are a bit sort of alarmed by this uh, about this demonstration against Wallace and being at the uh, at Tate's and Ives and I said well I do know someone who works so I'll give them a ring and ask them if they can organise it, the uh, demonstration. And I did speak to someone at ICA 
And I said, well, they said, are you going to be here and doing this thing? I said, no, we haven't got the time or energy or interest. But if you'd like to organise it, we're just putting out the idea. You know, we, we, we've got better things to do than demonstrate. So these things get picked up in that way. In the, in the early... In the early 90s, we were with Sub Pop, which was a, um, everyone probably knows Sub Pop now, it's a big American, turned into a sort of very important label in America. And we were the only English group who were on Sub Pop because some of their groups were fans of things I'd done when they were youngsters. And uh, we'd been ignored by the English music press all the way, you know, for the first 15 years of what we'd done, largely anyway. And then all of a sudden, because we were on Sub Pop and they had Nirvana and Mudhoney, they said, uh, oh, well, you know, we'll do an interview with you for the uh, NME. I said, great. I said, can we, I said, are you doing the interview because I've done 15 years of independent music or because I'm on Sub Pop? I said, oh, well, because you're on Sub Pop. I said, all right, okay, can we mention that at the beginning of the interview? I said, well, no. I said, well, why not? I said, well, we don't have anything like that now. I said, well, I don't want to do the interview then. I said, well, is there any other way you'd consider doing the interview? I said, I edit it. And they said, no, you, you can't, we can't do the interview on that basis. I said, OK, all right. So we released a single called We Ate the Fucking NME. <laughs> and the single had a great big list of everybody who's been in NME and what a twat they are, which, in, which included myself. And I, 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 a really great line, it says, me and Madonna hate the NME. I thought, it'd be good me and Madonna being together, hating the NME. And certain people at the enemy, I mean, we did get a review for that, and they told us that we needed to go and dig a, dig a grave for our own in self-integrity. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a bit churlish. But there were people at the enemy who sort of like sensible people at the enemy who said to me, oh, well, he's a bloody dick, what, that bloke? And they were putting it on their um, answer phones. Because, you see, we're on the side of the people who work at the enemy, because if you work at the enemy, you've, you must hate it more than I do, because I don't give a shit about the enemy. So really, what we're doing, we're putting out ideas of, that, you know, if you're knocking, you know, there's no, um, there's nothing vehement about any of our art hate, or any of the uh, little acts of rebellion you do. There's no sort of, like, spite at all. In anything. So what happens is, is you're putting out an idea that you could take the piss out of who you work for, which I think is really, really important. And you know, if you're working somewhere and you're in within some organisation, you should be able to take the piss out of that. And if you're quite high up the organisation, you should really spend quite a bit of time taking the piss out of yourself, do you, do you because this is the only way that you don't over-identify with how smart you've become in the world, because. You need people to tell you that you're a twat. You're doing a, you're doing a good job telling the tape they're twats. Is that right? How mm. do you think? How do you think they 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 well, we did, we the, did, uh, we the went, attention? Well, we went across to the tape when we did the. For, it's the only place we went to for to meet, and that was to give out some leaflets outside the tape. And we did do a little art hate swastika in the per turbine or human swastika lying on the floor, and and we used the symbol of the hung swastika, which is a, uh, a symbol of resistance against fascism, in the, which I got from the Warsaw Ghetto. And this is the symbol of the art hate. So really, it's against dominator culture, really, you would say. And it, doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean that everything within that dominator culture is wrong. It means that you must always be able to... There must be always something there questioning it. And there must be always something on the other end of the seesaw. And no, the more people who are... Whenever I was a kid, if there's a crowd over there, I'd go and stand over there. And I don't think it's reactionary, it's actually a, a longing for balance. How, how is your sense of balance in, in this context of being in these prestigious, oh, well, very worldly well, well, galleries? Well, when, it, I, when, I was, when I was at Art Basel, people came up to me because we, they sold out in the preview of my paintings. And uh, the press and everyone was all going a bit crazy. And they come and ask me, you know, oh, you must be, must be brilliant and fantastic. I said, well, it's, I was su surprised that I sold a load of paints, but previously I was surprised I didn't. So it sort of balances, <laughs> it balances out a bit. And, you know, and I said, you know, like, and they, they, they didn't notice me sort of like jumping up and down. 
you know, that, that, which they, everyone wants you to do. And it's not because I've got a reserve against that, it's because, you know, I actually did say, you know, I go home and I'll paint pictures if I don't sell paintings, and I go home and paint pictures if I do. I mean, it's a nice thing, but I'm 50 years old, you know, and even at 17, I probably wouldn't have got out of my pram. And, you know, that's the wrong use of the getting out of your pram, isn't it? <laughs> I wouldn't have got out, got, out, got out of my pram and done a merry dance. That would be good. 17 year old. Does that answer that? Uh, uh, I think you're doing a good job answering it there, Billy. Well, Thank well, you very much. But when we, when we were at the tape, when we did our thing, we had all security people following us around. And these security people came over, and I had a chat with them, and we had a little laugh, and I, they asked us about where we were, go where we were going. Because they'd been told to keep an eye on what we were doing and what we were behaving like. But you see, none of these people understand that we're sort of like ladies and gentlemen. You know, I don't um, harbour... I mean, we did the big poster campaign against Cameron, which speaks society, big cunt, and eat and fuck up. <laughs> And all of this stuff. But, you know, I wouldn't... I don't actually got anything against Cameron, you know. It's, it it tries, tries me a little bit, but, you know, I wouldn't... Ha you know, obviously, as a human being, and it's, uh, it's a, must be a great misfortune for him to be who he is. So you've got, to, you've got to sort of, like, have compassion for these people, but it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to make a joke. And maybe it can be a poignant joke as well. But, you know, there's no... Um, no, I don't agree with um, violence or, or, or things that incite violence or ideas towards violence. I, I agree with people demonstrating. And I think it's lamentable when, uh, when we give in to our lower instincts, for a, whether, you're a, whether you're a policeman or a, or a uh, protester. I remember saying to Jamie Reid, we were talking about some... Um, he was talking to... Jimmy Corty about one of his things about he, Jamie said to me, oh, they fire infrared into the eyes of these pilots um, who are trying to line, land planes like you get these big infrared guns I said, well, that's not very nice and, I, and then they said, well, you know these are, this is something that people do and blah, 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 and I said, you've got to realise I'm on the side of the police so there you are I wouldn't do it to my worst enemy. Yeah. Infrared in the eyes isn't it's really not nice. on. Um, I went to an opening the other day and um, uh, Peter Doig was there. It was all very um, high status art world stuff and Peter Doig was there with his students. And, um, and get in. Well, I thought of you. <laughs> I thought it was nice of Peter to, know, to, yeah. to have students and to take them to these posh art things. Yeah. And, uh, but I thought of you, and I thought of you, you as a teacher. And um, how does that idea fit? Well, I've done, I've, I did go, because I did teach at the Royal College about ten years ago for a little while. I don't necessarily mean in institutions, I mean as part of a kind of spiritual duty. Well, you've got to have something to teach. You know, you pick up things and you learn things. I'm still a beginner. But as far as art schools go, I did teach in art schools, but they, the art schools don't like it when they find out what I'm teaching them. You know, when I speak to the students, I'm very... Um, uh, I'm not interested in bullying them or, uh, or deriding their work, which it doesn't go down too well. I, 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 my main concern for people who are in institutions being taught is that they're surviving in it and that they're being talked to as individuals and not being brainwashed into trying to become successful. And that's sort of like a little bit opposed to the way that we usually teach people. Every, whenever, whenever I do do teaching, all I do is do the opposite of what I was taught when I was at art school. I've been to art school four times. You know, the idea is I'm self-taught, but I did go in... I got into art school when I was 17 on St Martin's on those drawings. And I, I, went, I got into St Martin's three times on my work, I think, and another art school somewhere else. And, um, but every time I was in these places, before I got, finally got expelled, there was always this sort of... Um, it's very, very strange because most of the none of the teachers or tutors have, um, have to have any... Uh, 
uh, qualification to teach, and they get paid reasonably well. And it was when I was there, it was dominated by young men and some older men who wanted to be in the pub mainly. And they didn't like precocious, talented young men who might want to sleep with the same girls as they did on the course. So um, we had a few run-ins in terms of like expelled. But all I do is when I go along to an arts, uh, to, to a, uh, to do any teaching, is I don't do the normal tutoring. Anyone been to art school here? Show of hands? It's quite a few. Because I know how to teach in art school properly. How about this? I'll come in and I'll see, there's two young ladies there. I'll come in and see your work. And I'll go, come up to you and I'll look. And if you're doing something small, I'll tell you to do it big. And if you're doing something big, I'll tell you to do it small. Then I'll go to the pub. <laughs> and then I'll spring on you that you've got to explain yourself. And I might, if I'm in a bad mood, I might bully you in front of the other students and sort of demand some real sort of like real reason why you're doing what you're doing. And you better be good at doing it. You know, this is like a nice little bit of bullying. And then if there's any precocious young men about, I'll try and crush them because I want, <laughs> I want to talk to those girls over there. I don't want them talking to those girls over there. And I don't think that's the way to educate people. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> you know. It, it, so I'm quite good at teaching in art school. Spiritually, I've sort of like got a long way to go. What about the uh, energy coming out of your work, the per the energy, the the um, the life message? The is that if, if I use the word message, is it? I mean, I yeah. relate that to teaching. The, yeah, obviously, the quality can, of the message. obviously you can pick some things up, and some things would be wise not to pick up, or or to use as an example of not what not to do. <laughs> and uh, but some things, yeah, I think that like I mean, I've got a very I'm very got a very strong moral sense and idea of honour and uh, but I've also got a great problem of being outspoken and not considering other people's feelings too well you know like uh, I'll I'll often say what I don't like which is a big mistake I don't do that to students but you know in, because I think hey, there it's one to one and I can remember not to do it but when I'm in the world I find it very difficult to sort of be be correctly enthusiastic about things that I think are nonsense. And that's always, you know, that's why it took me to be 50 before I sort of like was allowed one toe in the door, I think. But yeah, I think there's stuff to learn from that. By example then, by example I would say that I think it's, because I do a lot of work by anybody's standards without any modesty, you know, like I could just be a painter and musician or writer, because I work quite a lot in each of those areas, but a lot of it isn't, is because I'm able to do a great deal of work because I don't have a uh, worry about that type of thing. I don't worry about work. You know, I've got lots of areas in my life which I'm working on where, you know, I've got the normal human culture of worry, but I don't, and I, and I think anybody who's prolific will have this ability to step over their anxiety or realise that you're engaged with your anxiety. Some people sometimes think that, that means I don't care or don't use any discrimination. But generally, it's a matter of, um, I've seen people work very, very hard and very slowly to achieve something like a LP. Take a year or two to record it and it's got four good tracks on it. And I've recorded an album in a day and a half and it's got four good tracks on it. So I don't, I think they're wasting their time. You know, once you get to a certain degree of sort of like faffing with something, you're putting so much more of your, um, your ego's worry about how you're perceived by the rest of the world into this sort of armour-plated example of brilliance that other people can, other people's egos can then identify with because it feels like a complete safe safe option. It doesn't worry anybody. Or if it does worry anybody, it worries them in the correct way, which is a, a, in the cool way that other people agree with. You know. When I, and I think it doesn't achieve anything. What you really got to do is, you know, you got to um, allow yourself to express some aspects of yourself. Some which will be pleasant, some which will be less pleasant. But not, um, not sweat it and not be overly identified with the work. 
in a sense, the less identified you are with the work, the more successful and in many ways, the more it will appear to be personal to the person who did it. You know, it has, goes the opposite way. It suddenly, uh, suddenly allows a little bit of your nature to be in the work, you know, rather than your, your worry about being patted on the head. And our society is, you know, we're all very fearful and worried about acceptance and peer pressures and, um, and making it and winning. I think winning is the big important thing in our society. And I think that's why we have all the problems that we do, is basically the, everybody wanting to win. And this doesn't, I, I include myself in that, but when I see that, these aspects in myself, I tend to mock them as well as in other people and try to diffuse that energy because I don't see it being of any benefit to me or anybody else because that isn't a way to get happy. The way to get happy is to be okay. It's not, it, would, yeah. would it be a worry not to work? How conditional is your, um, oh. the, ha the happiness you're talking oh, about my, on working? What, yeah, about, what yeah. about the worry of not working? Well, I don't have the worry of not working, but I'm certainly compulsive. And if I was chained down, it might worry me a bit. And then I might have to uh, be forced to put more of that energy inwards into a more of a spiritual quest. But you've also got this... Um, it's like, a, if you've got... It's very important to go with your nature. You know, but you want to see what your nature is. Not what you think your nature is, but what your nature is. Not what you imagine it to be, but where, you, you know, the things you enjoy and what you like doing which aren't damaging to other people, you know, like your dream. It's very important to go with those things because you're then, you're, you're in, at least you're in, in, in accordance with your nature. And to try and stem that because of worries of uh, maybe it being slightly addictive or crazy would probably result in more harm than good because you're trying to control something that doesn't really need to be controlled I mean if you've got very negative um, areas in your life where you want to express things that are going to be quite damaging to yourself and other people then of course um, gaining some control and other outlets for that would be very important but things that are in accordance with your nature and the nature of, uh, of the universe for want of a better term Sounds like a very good term to me. That those things I don't think are worth stemming. If you're staying up too late and it's knackering you and you can't stop, then you can then you can address maybe the amount of coffee you're drinking. I'm quite serious about that. All Van Gogh's work is done on coffee, black coffee and bad nutrition. You know, really bad combination. Nothing to make someone very happy, you know. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been reading a bit about Van Gogh, and I did worry about him a bit, the way he was leading his life and what he was up to. I thought it was... Well, it's a great sort of, he's a, in a bit of a tailspin, wasn't he? You know, probably if you've got a bit of madness in there, whether it be syphilis or whatever, it causes problems. The fact that he could knock together a good picture is a great bonus. What about his drinking? Do you have an opinion about his drinking? Well, obviously it didn't work. These are the things, you know, in some ways, the, the only thing I would say about Van Gogh is I've, I've, it seems that despite all the negativity, which I think is a huge amount, that the, he did seem content when he died. I mean, he shot himself, he knows he's dying and he's having a pipe and not fretting. And you do sort of think, well, he had some, must have had something worked out, because I don't think as many of us who would if you're mad enough to shoot yourself anyway, would be able to sit back and sort of like actually be calm in this process at the end. I, I, so it shows a quite a depth of character, but everything previous to that suggests to me that it could have been a very different story and a better one. But you can't really, you, we can't know another person's journey. But I wasn't, I'm, that's the thing that impresses me at the end for someone who's been been through that much turmoil, you know, and he's a young man as well, don't you? Yeah. But, you know, a lot of people think that Van Gogh's um, a pet obsession of mine is just something that comes up. 
It's because I was I was read uh, read the story of Van Gogh when I was very young by my mother, and it was a model for me of uh, how to engage with art, I suppose. But you know, the model be it in the sense of uh, dedication to the object, not the uh, success. And, I, and you know, and I really like you know. <coughs> If you take away Van Gogh's writing, and you've taken away half of him at least, it's this incredible, incredible sensitivity and incredible mind, you know, great thinker and an amazing human being. Probably not quite so good to hang around with, I'd imagine. But, you know, as someone who ex to expressed himself very well and his relationship with God and his journey was really... It, it, I mean, it's fantastic writing. You don't get many writers who can pull that together. But, you know, as far as the paintings go, they're right. What about your painting? It's trained, right. it's magnificent. It's, it's, it's magnificent painting. It's very um, full. And um, it, 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 the last few years have seen, a, is it, do you mind me saying, that developmental changes and new explorings and new consolidations. I don't mind you saying that, but you know, I, I would see it as all, all one thing going, you see, because it's like, uh, you get moments when, you, when, when things come along quite a lot quicker, and it appears that, there, that, it, it appears that there's um, been a um, very big sea change, but really these things are like, are like gears, you know, you get this, you know, you get this build-up of pressure. Then you finally change gear. You get this build-up pressure. You find gear, and this is actually being with the work and how it wants to do it. I mean, it was a big coincidence that when I did that those shows, it meant I could rent a big, drafty old warehouse off a complete, of a very uh, unusual lady in Whitstable, and uh, it meant that I could do large paintings, which I've never been able to do before, and that changes things quite a bit. Doing some large paintings. But, you know, I don't think, I never think anything's really particularly getting better. It's sort of like it's doing the same job as the paintings did before, for me, because all it is is painting. There's no, um, sometimes I get a kick out of it for five minutes, and sometimes I get a kick out of it looking at a painting I've done, but for me it's very much over. The, you, the thing about painting pictures is painting pictures. The end result is sort of like just a nuisance. <laughs> I mean, if someone likes it and wants to do something with it, and we live in a world where these things can be coveted or, or bought, and you can make a living move it, uh, moving through that, then that's really uh, quite handy. But it's all, and it's, but it's as inexplicable as anything else humans get up to. You know, what we buy and sell, and why we do it, and what sort of uh, relevance to us. Very, very, very strange. But art isn't different from anything else in in that strangeness. I would say to people, why would artists not be a bunch of arseholes? Because most of, most plumbers are. <laughs> you got a plumber who comes and does what he says he's going to do, you, you think he's like God. Yeah. You get an artist who does what he say, says he's going to do, you think he's like God. There's no difference. It's just amazing that someone does what they said they're going to do. Meet a nice bank manager, you think, Christ, dynamite. Meet someone who's friendly to you at the till, and uh, who actually is there and isn't, you know, in the, in the service station and doesn't hate you because they don't want to be there. Exactly the same as me and an artist who doesn't hate you because he doesn't want to be there. So do you, um, you're symp sympathetic to the idea of the artist being of service, service to community? What do you think of that idea? I don't know. <laughs> service. No, I think we serve ourselves largely, but I think the more that other people are aware of other people and can employ good manners, then the better it will be for them, for the artist and for the uh, person. And, and again, same for the petrol pump attendant and anyone who has their job. Everybody's uh, of equal value. What, what I mean is, if the artist is true to uh, his or herself, truly, utterly true, then they may not be thinking about the... Um, yeah, well, they'd probably the, give up art, hopefully. they give up what? Art by that time. I mean, art is just another affect of life, of sort of like running through life, you know, I mean, if it's your nature and you did art but anyway, but I mean, if you're actually really with it, uh, there'd be, um, there'd at least be the choice, which we were talking about earlier, of doing it or not doing it. 
uh, at the minute, you know, like someone like myself is quite driven because of the the impulses that come through through me. And uh, once you move beyond those impulses, that means that you would have to you would have the choice of doing less. If if we look without it being damaging to yourself, because I realise there's a contradiction here. But it, I mean, actually having the choice. I mean, I don't think that doing a lot is a problem as long as it's not hurting anybody. But it certainly is uh, something that can be feel like something that's driving you rather than it's something that you're observing and you're doing. Okay, me representing uh, 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 an, uh, the outside view, mm -hmm. representing the art, um, the uh, um, being a, an outside observer would say that th throughout your work there, 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 there's a, there are messages, there is service, there, is, there are di didactic periods, there are challenges, there are expressions of beauty and um, there, there, there's a lot of, um, it's, it's, it, it, it is very engaged. So, so you're, you're saying that's not part of the artist's responsibility, the conscious responsibility. No, but it seems like to me it is, that is happening. I'm not sure if I'm saying that or not. There's a lot of things to, for me not to be saying. I mean, I mean not to be agreeing with. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that more. Um, I'm confused. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you how seriously you take the idea of service of responsibility to people watching, looking at well, your work, well, listening to your music, reading yeah, your well, poems. That would your cover, but I don't think all of those little categories, I think they wouldn't matter. What would matter would be um, uh, good manners. There's a, uh, because that would cover it. There's this fellow, I can't remember his name, he's a Zen teacher. I think he's a I don't know much about Zen Buddhism, not an area I've been involved in. But there's a um, one of their major teachers, I think from, I think it could be a thousand, or, about a thousand years ago, or it might be two thousand years ago. That's how little I'm aware of him. But it's this saying that this fellow said, and he said that next to, uh, next to good manners, enlightenment was the most important thing. And that sounds a bit chuckly, but this bloke was on the money. Because it's how you treat other people. And manners are, you know, I mean, more and more I sort of like go through life, I realise that uh, good manners is, is probably, probably very, very, very under, underrated and very, very important. Because everything that annoys us and sets us against each other is usually your mannered and not consider well you know we could go to we could say consideration or just take on spiritual and treat, treating people um, how you'd like to be treated but I think if you're saying good manners it's you say it to, down to good manners it's much more shocking for some reason because people don't think of people think of good manners would be a bit straight and boring whereas a good manners is uh, 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 I always try to be polite to people and actually, the more when you, if any of you come and speak to me and like, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm impolite. That means that I sort of like feel reasonably familiar, because <laughs> I save my nastiest for people I like, people I deal with. I, I really try and do good manners, and I actually do try and use honesty and integrity of everyone I deal with. And uh, but I've I've noticed that um, once I get familiar with people, I can be a bit rude sometimes, can't I? Mean? Yes, Billy. <laughs> what? But I don't. I don't mean to. You know, if ever I ever hurt anybody's feelings or upset people, which I'm very good at, it, as soon as I was aware of it, I would. I, I very uh, keen to uh, apologise and uh, for that behaviour, regardless of if it was intentional or unintentional. You know, I try not to defend myself and sort of say, "Oh well, yeah, but you did this." I really try not to do that. That's really crap. I'm not sure how much time we've got left. Is there enough time to talk about the, your use of the word God and what that means? I don't know. It's not up to me how much time we've left. I've got what? I think I've got five, 
five and a half seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you 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 take an idea and your your understanding of the word manners and that that mean you know that to reconcile that with usual opinion may be a little, little bit difficult the way, the way things go. What about your use of the word God? You're very happy using that word in your I have been, yeah, I have been, yeah, and it's probably because, you know, it's a, a vague idea that I sort of like, that seems to be necessary to be there. Because I've noticed, like, reading Dostoevsky and people, their, their novels are, and their, the meaning of the work is always better if you've got good God in there as well, because it seems to help negate the person's ego, at least, to a degree, and also makes people think they're not top, top dog. Now, my, my understanding of these things is changing quite rapidly as I sort of like, um, I'm very interested in Vedanta and studying Vedanta, you know, self-inquiry. And there's some very interesting ideas within that about, you know, this is the very old verdict te teachings, which are modifying my opinions daily. And there, you see, in Vedanta, God would be God would be like the collective unconsciousness of all self within the universe, which makes up one big mass of God. The, uh, the collective unconscious, rather than you or me separate, or feeling separate. And all of that would be, under, uh, all that would be illuminated by self anyway, which is the ultimate and unchanging, which is uh, separate from God anyway. Because this is in Vedanta teaching, and I've not qualified to talk about it much, um, but it's something that I'm looking re 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 really interested in, the notion of the self being um, omnipresent, never changing and equal in everybody. So your, your, um, the thing that illuminates you and who you truly are is the same as what illuminates me, so there's only one self within everything. And then you've got all the muck of who we think we are sitting on front of that putting all our opinions and all our views in there and this identification with a material world and God is in the Vedanta term was, would be the uh, all of that all together, everything that's known in that world beyond the self that illuminates everything is unchanging but yeah God's, God's good and God's important, and God is uh, has moral code and uh, interested in good manners and behaviour and all of those things will make life a easier journey and a less uh, a less ignorant journey. But maybe you know, it doesn't mean you've got to cling to goodness. It means you've got to try and wake up and always keep an inquiring mind and listen in and find out if there's a... Listen in to find out how ignorant we really are. I think that is great, Billy. Thank you very much. We have to stop, I believe. I think that's a great, um, great talk. Okay, thank you, so thank you very much, Billy. Sorry. <laughs> no one. I, before we started, they said no. There wasn't going to be any time for questions, and uh, that was already worked out because it's a short run, and that's why there aren't any um, because it's a short time on. And they, I just letting you know that the that was the situation. I like questions a lot, and uh, but we don't have time. Okay. Well, can you ask one question? Yeah. What is our hate? Oh, what is art hate? Steve wanted art hate. Okay, I'll do this for you, Steve. What is art hate? We did not come here to answer cuntish questions. <laughs> <laughs>